Um, hi, everybody. I'm Jennifer Cunningham. I'm the AVP of Alumni Relations here at Lehigh University. And um, I'm just going to give you a little bit of choreography of how these webinars work if you have not been on one before. Um, we are going to hear from our speaker for about 15 minutes or so while she talks about her um, her career and what she's doing and how it's helping to change the world. And then we'll take uh, questions and comments from you all over the chat box. And the chat box is something you can access if you go to the bottom of your screen and just check that box. You can either send your questions just to the hosts um, or you can send it to all the participants so everyone can see what you are asking. And I will read those aloud um, to Nadia so she can focus on her answers and not reading uh, the chat. Um, we are recording. So if you do have to drop off early or you have friends that you would like uh, to see this later, you can forward that to them. Um, and that's it for me. We will get started right now with uh, Dr. Nadia Sasso, who graduated from Lehigh with a graduate degree in uh, 2014 and then went on to Cornell University to get her PhD. And now she is the co-founder of Blader Box, which she'll tell us about, um, which supports Black creators. And um, I'll let you tell everybody more, Nadia. Yeah. <laughs> well, good morning for those of us on the West Coast like myself and good afternoon to those of you on the East Coast. Thank you so much for joining me today as I talk about uh, Bladerbox, which is an app that I developed with a, with a fellow colleague of mine that I went to Bucknell University with. So we can get started. Building Blader, utilizing tech to disrupt the entertainment industry. And you're probably wondering, what does that mean? So Blader, <laughs> Blader means Black creator. So we simply just put Black creator, the two words together, and we here we have Blader. And the box literally just represents the app. So what we'll go over today, I'll tell you a little bit about myself and my co-founder, um, what the problem that we were seeing uh, the solution that we came up with, what our business model is, um, some key features on the app, what's happening with the app right now. And you probably are like, well, what isn't, aren't there things out there like this? So we'll get into that as well and what makes us different. So again, my name is Nadia Sasso. I am actually the chief brand officer for Blader Box, also um, creative cultural strategist. And you're probably like, oh, what do you mean by that? So it's my job to make sure that um, the branding for Blader Box works and tells a succinct story around all of our platforms. Um, that goes from visual to actual copy, as well as making sure that we are, um, you know, we're speaking to the people and the audiences that we want to speak to very clearly. My job is also as the creative uh, co-founder to really be the voice to a lot of the creatives in the industry and to, um, to better provide services that tap into what they would need. My co-founder passion artist is a CPA. She's also the chief executive officer and cross-functional strategist. Um, she, Basically, passion makes sure every aspect of the business works well together um, and functions well so that we have a great system all around. Um, and given her background with CPA, she's definitely up to date with all of our finances and fundraising, and that would not be me. <laughs> Um, you're probably wondering our background. So Passion and I combined represent some of the top companies around the United States, right? So Netflix, A24, PricewaterCooper, Nielsen, PBS, Disney, um, MTV, Jet Magazine, um, Blavity News, Huffington Post, you name it. We have worked um, in various capacities with all of these companies, whether as employees, whether as creatives, um, and simply utilizing these experience to really develop this app that I'm going to tell you about. So you're probably wondering why an app that focuses on finding Black creatives? So we found out that less than 6% of Hollywood film writers, directors, and producers are Black. 
and only 5% are showrunners. Um, given the fact that this is 2022, those are disturbing numbers. <laughs> Um, I would also say that as a creative on set um, um, in different capacities from producer to director um, to also supervising manager sometimes, I am not proud to say that I'm sometimes the only Black person in the room. And I think talking about that with my co-founder, we were like, what can we do to change that? Um, and her coming from Netflix and being in procurement and running through invoices, she was also seeing the same thing that there were rarely any invoices for, um, for creatives of color, let alone black creatives. And also she was seeing that there were, they didn't have sometimes the acumen to really function high level with these big corporate companies like Netflix. So with that, we also thought it would be great, I'll get into that later, resources through Blader University to make sure that they are able to manage their clients um, better. We, um, second, we found that underrepresentation of off-screen Black creators cost the entertainment industry an estimated $10 billion in annual revenue. That is a lot of money. That's a lot of money being left on the table for the entertainment industry that I think could, they could really use just simply being more inclusive. Number three, brands do not have streamlined access to readily available databases of vetted Black creators who are tried and true. And so what we mean by that is we want to make sure, you know, so we've come into several conversations where they're like, oh, well, you know, how well do they work? Um, can you speak to their work? And you know, we all know that word of mouth is also is still a great marketing tool. So we want to make sure that when people are working with Bladerbox, they have access to the best of the best and that we are constantly working with creatives on our database to make sure they have everything that they need to succeed, whether it's managing their businesses, managing their business to managing their clients to making sure that they deliver all deliverables on time. So that's our goal. So our solution with all of these things that we found disturbing in the industry was to create a marketplace that makes it easy for brands to discover and hire vetted Black creators, also known as bladers, in multiple locations and disciplines. So with the app right now, it is a web app, not necessarily on the App Store or um or Android, on Android devices just yet, we are actually working to find a CTO um, to really take it to the next level. But for now, as a web-based app, you can literally go into the app, you can search by location, by city that you're in or whatever state you're in and find creatives, whether it's for photography, uh, videography, and you're looking for a creative director, uh, you name it. We look forward to expanding some of those categories and making sure that we have a robust list in all locations. However, we really just soft launched this app um, about less than a year ago. So I think we're doing pretty good <laughs> with that said. So our business model, you're probably wondering, how is this sustainable? Is this really going to uh, change the industry? And how would that be, you know, how, how could that be? How could that happen? So we are a business to business model. So we not only target black creatives by offering freelance physical and digital creative services, but we also are looking to work with advertising agencies who want to fulfill creative projects. So eventually we'll work more with the film industry and different industries like that. However, I think targeting advertising agencies who tend to work with all of the you know, different entertainment industries is a great start to, um, to build, I guess, a great name for our brand and what we have to offer. And so when we look at how this breaks down even further, you know, investors would be interested in this simply um, from the fact of referral fees to service fees for managing projects with bladers. Um, brands, again, get access to highly um, vetted bladers as well. And just it's refreshing when working on a project to hire the right person with the right skill set. 
And so that's what we aim for. And for creators, our goal is for them to get discovered, gain new clients, um, because sometimes we find that creatives are so creative and so great at what they do that they sometimes lack the business and marketing aspect. And we would love to help with that um, to elevate their business. And of course, provide them resources and tools to do so as well. So again, our key features um, to disrupting this industry is making bladers discoverable, making sure that they are vetted. And by vetted, we're not just going to say, oh, you're not great enough, you can't come in here, but ha having the tools to have them be up to par for what we feel that our clients or agencies that we work with with need, and then just matching everyone with the right, you know, with the right company and the company with the right creative. Um, other features on the app that um, we're, since we're not in the app per se, you can literally favorite people that you have on the app. You can really go through testimonials to see if that's the right person for you when um, trying to find creators directly. Um, there's also a map so you can go through the locations, there's messaging, and there are, you can also pay um, creatives through the app as well. So right now we have about 300 user pro profiles, meaning people who come to the app looking for creatives, and we have about 45 blader profiles, meaning 45 creatives. Um, and I would say that's simply, um, I think that's pretty good for just pre-launching and where we're going, but of course we would love to increase that by a lot. And so we are literally focusing a lot of our efforts right now on fundraising and working with venture capitalists, because I think once we can expand our team, I think it would be much easier to attract both ad agencies and creatives. Um, however, in while doing so, we also have been supporting creatives. Recently, we gave four or $500 grants to four creatives who were passionate about taking their business um, to the next level. So we're still interacting with the community and building community in the best ways we know possible, but we're also looking to scale in a major way. And so you're probably wondering, well, why Blader? You know, there's other, um, there's other companies, other different things out there like Fiverr, Freelancer, Upwork, and Market Hire. And I would say, yes, you can go to those, but those are for like global freelancers. And while that may be great, they also may not be pre-vetted. You only have literally the star systems that they have or sometimes testimonial. Um, and mostly those are for marketing, right? And not necessarily all around um, creative service industries. So with us, we're looking to even expand to hair, nails, all those different things. Our idea is, is if, Let's say you were to create a movie and on a movie set, you have everyone from a director all the way to a manicurist um, on set to make sure that the whole process is, um, you know, it's handled from start to finish. And so that is our goal to be able to service every, um, every space when it comes to the creative um, dynamic in, those, in the entertainment industry. And so with us, again, again, we pre-vet our freelancers. Um, we consolidate resources um, into about seven categories. And um, we allow brands to basically create a multi multidisciplinary creative team. And so I would say our indirect competitors is, of course, their social media, um, our Instagram, now TikTok, where it, LinkedIn, Facebook, where you can actually search, you know, for people, but all, you know, all of them, it's gonna be hard to kind of find creators in that space at the same time, because it's, you have to go through so many hashtags, so many different things to kind of look this up. And social media is really designed for, you know, people to share their personal experiences and professional experiences. So it's really, you know, it's a little bit different than coming to the app, knowing that you're here just for looking for creative. Um, there was a question. Uh, yeah, why don't I ask the question because it's oh, okay. to relevant to what you're talking about. Uh, okay. Reginald is asking, um, are your vetting criteria for your creatives approved by the companies to which you refer them? Or are there industry standard criteria after which you model your criteria? 
So right now we um, we literally do industry standard criteria for which we model um, how we vet these creatives. However, depending on the ask of the client, if there needs to be a further vetting process or something that they would recommend um, with our discretion, we'll we'll let them know if we can perform that or not, or let them know you know if our service is for them. Um, so right now, that's basically what we do. Um, hope that answered your question. Um, yeah, Michael's asking, what is your evaluation process for the vetting? Okay, and so I think that kind of goes with the last part of Reginald's question. Does that seem like the biggest impediment to scaling? Yes and no. It's not a big impediment because we really, because we, in doing our research, that was a major, major thing that kept coming up was what um, quality work can they provide? Are they being provided? being vetted, I think people will pay top dollar for that service being provided, right? And then with scaling, how that works is we look to literally have almost like companies when they work with recruiters who then kind of vet um, executives or uh, managers or directors before even sending them to the company uh, for an interview, we would kind of operate in that way. Right now, in addition to that, what we do to vet um, vet our creatives is we definitely do we definitely do interviews. We also do testing depending on what their expertise is or what field they're in to make sure that they are knowledgeable about their subject matter. And then we also we also want to know exactly how their client management systems work um, before we put them in touch with the client because that lets us know whether we need to step in to manage that project further, which is an additional service, or if you know it's simply connecting the creative with the, with the client. So there's different ways in which this can work. I hope that answers everyone's questions so far. So well, let me clarify. So Netflix comes to you and says, um, we are looking for, you know, we've got this project. Can you help us find photographers and um, hair and makeup people? And then you say, okay, I'm on it. And then you go out and you find the best people for those jobs and present them with three or four people. Yes. And so we present them with um, offerings for basically exactly what they're working on based on their brief or RFP um, that they've given us. So that's exactly how we do it. So it's two ways. You can do it as a referral where we refer um, creatives to you. However, Netflix can say, hey, we just need these. I'll give you an example. Um, I worked on the homecoming project for Beyonce with Netflix and one of Beyonce's stipulations was to work with a predominantly Black crew on the entire project. And so that's kind of where this idea was birthed because everyone was scrambling where to go, how do we get people? Of course, this is Beyonce, so it needs to be top of the line creatives. And so we would A, refer them, but B, let's say Netflix or they're not working with a major production company is like, hey, we want you to manage this entire process to make sure the deliverables are done on time, which I've done before. And then that that is another that's another fee and, wow. you know, serving as an agency almost. So there's two ways in which Netflix can work with us. And then does do you how do you find out that, you know, say you get somebody hired? How mm -hmm. do you find out? Do you get feedback from the client that, yes, this person was a plus, you know, or. Do you have a process to sort of get feedback from your clients on the referrals? Yes. Right now, because we're so small, we're able to kind of directly speak with clients and manage that process. However, um, down our pipeline of things we're going to build into the software is there would be a dashboard for companies so that they have their own interface when working with the app. There'll be a dashboard for creatives and there'll be a dashboard, um, there'll be another, um, there'll be a third dashboard, but essentially everyone will have their own view of how this works best for them, mm -hmm. essentially, and how they would interact with us. And there would be chat messaging, um, you know, what they would see and different things like that. Yeah. Oh yeah, and then the third would be just for end users, sorry. Okay. Uh, Reginald has another question. I think you've published some of the companies you've worked with, but he says, are you permitted to publish the identities of companies that accept your referrals? Um, only if they allow us to. Mm -hmm. So we have to ask permission before um, utilizing their names. Yeah. And, and you gave a list at the beginning. 
Yes. Yes. And some others. Yeah. Yeah. We cannot just, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, We don't want to get sued before we even get started. (laughs) Right. Right. Well, and it's also, I think what Reginald is, is referring to is that to say that you've worked with Netflix, like that instantly puts you up here, you Mm -hmm. know, well, if they worked with Netflix, they must be great, you know? Right. 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 So, yeah. All right. Let's carry on with the rest of your presentation. Yes. Um, So basically, that basically gives you a roundabout of who we are, what we do, who our competitors are, how we plan to disrupt the industry. And at this point, I'm open for further questions and anything else you all want to know about what our process has been like so far. Um, I know one question that people always ask is, how did you even build a web app? Mm -hmm. Uh, We uh, used a service called Adala, which does not allow for code which is great for (laughs) techies, but non-techies like myself, (laughs) simply be able to, um, to simply be able to build an app, have an MVP when the things that people can actually interact with in order to get to the next level of um, where this app could take us. That's fantastic because, um, and I'm going to jump in while people are thinking about their questions. Um, um, We've been thinking about how do we get people using the alumni network more? Like as you were talking, I was thinking, I'm sure Reginald too, because he's he was a um, co-president of Balance, which is our Black and Latinx um, community, right. thinking about how do we let other people know what mm-hmm. other balance members or other members of the Lehigh community are doing so that if they need a dentist or a doctor or a lawyer or something, how do we easily do that? And the apps we have right now are a little bit clunky for that. Um, LinkedIn, as you said, is just sort of this wild west of right. they're not vetted or people can't really easily find each other. So I'm going to check out that app that you talked about. Um, yeah, I would definitely check out Adalo. Um It actually is very simple. It kind of works on the back end, like with a lot of spreadsheets and Google Docs. So it's kind of easy for those of us who are, again, not interested in code or don't know much about code. And I think it's really great to manage a community, um, like an alumni community, right? So you can kind of find a directory. Everyone can access it on the web and go from there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so Danielle Tate is also on the leadership team of Balance, and she's asking, have you ever, have you given any consideration to hiring alumni and or student interns? So alumni, not as much, but we definitely have hired student interns. So currently it's myself and Passion. We are currently locking in, well, with our lawyer, a contract for um, a CTO. So that's a chief technology officer, as well as a leads um, director, a sales, basically a sales director Mm -hmm. who would basically come up with our um, go-to-market strategy as to how we plan on going to market. So those are the two important roles that we're working on. And then we have about three interns. We're always looking for interns um, because as you can tell, there's a lot of work that needs to be done uh, to actually be able to make major waves in this industry. And so we're open to ideas or referrals or anyone um, that you may know, but we have been reaching out to our alma maters uh, to, to get interns and to um, see which students might be interested in working with us. Yeah, we have, do you know Cashy Johnson or Mark Wilson yeah. here at Lehigh? Yeah. Yes. They are probably very good pipelines uh, for interns for you. Right. Um, Michael Price is asking, how many people are currently on your team? Oh, so we have, oh, we have the three interns. Well, we call them project managers because they're, they're out of, they've kind of graduated undergrad and like onto like, you know, master's programs and different things like that. So um, we have about three of those. And then we are, like I said, we're locking in a CTO and a um, sales, a sales manager. So, so still relatively small. For yeah. yeah, we're still definitely happening. small. Yeah, we're definitely small. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So Reggie says, from my experience over the years, there are a few professional areas in which Lehigh alums are not positioned. We need to consider how this connection can be made. Yeah, we have 85,000 alumni around the world. Um, Oh, wow. Yeah. So I'm sure we can 
find you that CTO and that sales and wow. you can just make it a whole Lehigh thing. Sorry to you. Yes. To no, I would love that. I would love that. I can even connect with you all further sure. to give you a job description of what that entails and any information um, as we as we grow this company. Yeah, yeah, we definitely have people in the entertainment industry. Um, yeah, a lot of people. And Mary Beth Tully is the new president of our um, alumni association board, and oh. also knows everybody. Re between Mary Beth and Reginald, I think. <laughs> We know about 45,000 alums. <laughs> right, 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 right. No, that would be amazing. Yeah. Uh, well, we, to be fair, we just started, I would say, top of the year, um, revamping what our business model and strategy would be. And I would say since January, we have definitely, in terms of the reaction from the investor community, I think it has been great, um, especially in terms of refining what it is we are, how we would go to market, how we would um, be a profitable business and different things like that and giving feedback. We have made it to the semifinals for about three major competitions. And so we're waiting to see what the next steps are and crossing our fingers. Um, because especially for one of them, there'll be, a, you know, at least a million dollars. So that would be a great start to get to where we need to go. But there's definitely been interest, which makes us feel like we're doing the right thing um, to get to where we need to go. Yeah. How did you and Passion meet? Oh, so Passion and I both went to Bucknell University. I was actually Passion's mentor. <laughs> uh, I was a senior when she was a freshman. And then I actually started a nonprofit. Um, I started a nonprofit and she was our CFO for a nonprofit. And then I also started a t-shirt line and she was a CFO again. So we've kind of like, she's kind of worked with me along the way mm -hmm. and so now we just got to a point where both of us were in the entertainment industry for the first time and we saw this problem and we were like we should just you know we should just solve it that's fantastic and princess asked a similar question as i was asking did yeah. you always see yourself as an entrepreneur and how did you grow into a self-starter throughout your academic and professional career Oh, that's a great question. I was definitely always an entrepreneur. <laughs> uh, I grew up in the Washington, D.C. Air, um, area, and I started off in high school, no, middle school. I actually used to sell, my grandmother had a vendor's license, so I used to borrow her license to get discounted jewelry <laughs> and sell them from my locker so people could get dressed with accessories from my locker. And then I've always been creative. I believe there's storytelling and everything from hair to actual films. And so I was, I did hair for a very long time. Actually hair has gotten me through almost every university <laughs> doing hair because unfortunately being at like, but being in Lewisburg or Bethlehem or Ithaca, there was right. never really any black hairstylist. Right. Um, funny story at Cornell, I started I was, we started like a mini hair company, my best friend and I, and we had to shut it down because we had an overwhelming amount of requests. And I actually wanted to graduate from Cornell. So I had to focus. <laughs> um, but I said it to say, I've always been an entrepreneur in that way um, to, uh, to kind of just be like less of a burden to my family and to kind of be more independent. From there, I did. I had a nonprofit. I had a T-shirt line. Mm -hmm. um, I also have my own business, Naughty Marie and Co., which is a marketing and production company. So I've always done these things, even throughout getting an academic career. It may seem impossible to many how I was able to juggle all these things, but I did it. I survived, and I graduated on time at every academic institution. Nice, <laughs> nice. that's amazing. Um, oh, yeah. You didn't, you never, did you ever come across Eve Carr at Cornell, Eve Carr Mom Perus? No, 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 no. Oh, I'll have to introduce you. She started a um, Creole Haitian hair line and was on um, Shark Tank. Oh, I would love to. Her business has just exploded. She's, she used to work for us in alumni relations there and just right. took off. She's, yeah. Anyway, side note, um, but I'll hook you up. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm going to take, someone just gave me a note about Blacks in Tech. Yes. Danielle um, Tate is also, at, yeah, she works at um, MIT. Um, Danielle does. Um, 
Blacks in Tech, a great professional community for those in tech or transitioning. And she also used to work at Bucknell. So maybe, ah. maybe you uh, did well, I wonder where, yeah, <laughs> I wonder what year. <laughs> Um, Antonio is asking, what advice would you give to young creatives and aspiring entrepreneurs? Oh, I was just asked this question yesterday, too, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, in a talk that I had. So I would say advice. Mm, let me remember what I said yesterday. So I talked about contracts and um, intellectual property, I would say mm -hmm. that would be my biggest advice. That was a mistake that I've made time and time again, mm -hmm. not having the proper contracts in place, whether I had the, I could afford a lawyer or not. Mm -hmm. I would say that you can always find an alumni community, a student, you know, anyone to just get feedback on what that looks like. But also um, sometimes you'll be surprised reaching out to top lawyers and that you could kind of be their give back you know, situation mm -hmm. where they're not charging you full price, but definitely have that in place from, you know, what ideas you're launching, NDAs to what do your partnerships look like if you're not work if you're not in business by yourself. A lot of people think that once you start bringing up contracts and partnerships, it, it seems as though you don't trust your partner. However, I think the opposite. I think that that builds trust. And if anything were to arise, you have a document mm -hmm. to refer to. So I would definitely say, all of the above and owning the rights to whatever you have. Um, there were several times, even the documentary that I made at Lehigh, um, where the cinematographer, once it started like gaining traction, was like, he deserves rights to the film, but it was my IP. And I had to get a lawyer and I had to pay him a significant amount of money because I did not know that if anyone um, records anything on their camera that they own, then they own the copyrights to that footage. So that's just a great example of protecting yourself at all costs and just asking questions and getting legal feedback before starting a project, whether you think it's going to be big or not. For me, mm -hmm. it was a school project and it was an, I mean, way more than a school project. So yeah, go there. And I would say also to aspiring um, entrepreneurs, really take the time. I know it seems overwhelming to set up your business, but really take the time to do so. Register your business, get an EIN number, uh, file business taxes. You can use apps like Keeper Tax to really um, keep keep up with your business expenses, really take the time, build business credit, um, really take the time to do those things because A, you don't want to burn yourself out uh, with your own, utilizing your own resources, working on your own credit or your own finances. You are more likely to get a loan and get a significant amount of help if you are set up as a business, um, especially when you're talking venture capitalist grants and different things like that they wanna know that you are taking this very seriously. So I would say, start with the right foundation. Um, yeah, great. great. I hope that that was helpful. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think I was sort of expecting an answer of like, follow your dreams, work hard, but no, oh. it's not like IP, <laughs> get your IP covered and the, the legal yeah. staff I think is, yeah. yeah. I would say, those are things that we don't really talk about in the entrepreneurship community. Sometimes our entrepreneurship is glorified because you get to make your own schedule, do your own thing, but understand that you still have a boss. Those are your clients. And right. having, you know, your legal set is very important. Having your finances set is very important. And then we could talk about all the pretty stuff and work ethic. And things like that. Right, right. But if you can't make it through that, then you definitely don't have the work ethic to be an entrepreneur. Yeah, um, and Princess is saying, alongside your own business intellectual property, how do you protect your creator's IP, their copyrights, and their rights of publicity? So same. So that goes with, so we have an aspect of Blader, Blader University, um, that literally we're, everything that I'm telling you all, we're teaching our creatives, yeah. you know, and we are reviewing contracts to make sure that it's in their favor. Mm -hmm. And we are making, you know, making sure things are equitable. We also, I'm going to push every blade to get, if you have it and you can afford it, get your own lawyer too, to review contracts, you know, just to teach them how to do things. Uh, I don't believe that it takes anything away from me or the business that we are started, Passion and I, to educate these individuals as much as possible 
how to build their own, you know, profitable business. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I love that you have that university. Um, that seems, and can anybody sign up for that or you have to be one of your vetted creatives to get oh, You have to, you just have to be a blader to be a part mm -hmm. of, to access that. And so um, what we started doing was building partnerships with companies like Debsato, which is a CRM, uh, building partnerships with companies like Keeper Tax, which allows teaches, um, which allows creatives to kind of understand their business finances and in order to itemize it in order to file their taxes properly and things like that. Keeper Tax also files your taxes for you. Um, if you're ten, keeping up with your 1099s and all those different things that are hard for even the everyday person to yeah. do. Yeah. So um, we look into things of though, those are the things that we bring a part of Blader, you know, Blader University and also having tax professionals come in and talk to people, mm -hmm. having um, legal professionals come in and talk to them about their work and what does that look like? And did you, you know, did you have an NDA before sharing your project idea? Mm -hmm. um, did the client do X, Y, and Z before you even started work? You know, just different things. Right. Right. Um, Reginald was just chiming in that the entertainment industry, in addition to the creatives, is also catering, vintners, fashion designers. Um, are they part of your platform as well, or do you plan to add them? So we plan to, hold on, what, sorry, what was that again? Um, so just saying that in addition to creatives, there's also caterers and vintners and fashion designers and hairstylists and all kinds of people that are also in the creative or that serve right. the entertainment into industry that aren't necessarily creatives. Right. Um, do, does your platform encompass? So right now we do have hairstylists yeah. and we even have nail techs. We do not have caterers. Um, we do not have fashion designers just yet. I think that that's something that we have to, we have to figure out what that process will look like, if that makes sense. And what that that funnel will look like. I think we want to be really strategic about what categories we have to ensure, again, our biggest thing is that they're vetted and that we can ensure quality work and that we can deliver on time. Wow. And so we would have to figure out what that, you know, what that looks like. And yeah. Can deliver that. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's national, right? So if there's, if we come across people wherever they are, we can recommend that they sign right. up. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And thank um, you for all the um, the tips. Uh, yeah. For... Um, yeah. Danielle is saying to look up Ruki Tijani. She founded a company called Firm for the Culture. She's a black trademark. She's she's a black trademark attorney on the West Coast, and she heard about her through a podcast called Cultivating right. Her Space. Um, right. Princess is asking, how have your networks with your academic institutions? in particular Lehigh, helped you eval elevate your venture. So have you tapped into our network at all yet? So I think this is my first step into tapping into this network, <laughs> into <laughs> Lehigh's network. I think this was a great platform to really just speak about what we're doing, what we plan on doing, and then again, getting feedback like what's happening in the chat right now mm -hmm. and recommendations, and then moving forward from here to see how we can work with the Lehigh community. Uh, the Lehigh community has always been supportive of anything that I've done. Yeah. So yeah. Um, I'm really happy to continue growing this relationship. Uh, but yes, with uh, Cornell, Bucknell, we've all kind of high, we've all like attracted interns from those different programs. Uh, we have also gotten feedback for how to approach venture capitalists and to solidify our pitch. Yeah. So we've definitely used, utilized our resources in any way possible that, you know, was a natural process that wasn't too much on any one entity to, you know, to grow this business. Yeah. Well, certainly you have the right people in Princess Danielle Reginald, at least on this call Michael um I'm sure you should, to, yeah I definitely connect my, yeah I'm gonna put my email fantastic in here as well yeah and I think Mark Wilson is the new um head of Zollner okay art oh, center sure. here and oh, so yeah. he knows a lot of people um in that space of course Cashy is very well connected um, yeah I worked with Cashy while I was there yeah yeah, yeah. Um, and we have a lot of um, alums too, balance members and others who are also, um, you know, doing startups and 
um, who are venture capitalists and that kind of thing. So there may be like one or two steps ahead of you that could yes. connect with you. And that is definitely amazing. Yeah. <laughs> it's really amazing to, uh, to get that feedback and to grow and to see where we can go with this. So. Yeah, for sure. It's a very supportive network. Once you tap in, which I'm ha- so happy that you that you yeah. could. Yeah, yeah, and it's been helpful because I think we birthed this during the pandemic, so there wasn't a lot of traditional networking. So a lot of it was like email, and people were a little overwhelmed. And so now to have a little bit of balance of virtual and con- and real life connections, I think we've really been trying to. Uh, take advantage of that. <laughs> yeah. Well, and and when we were um, during the pandemic and after uh, George Floyd tragedy and um, Black Lives Matter, so we were trying as a staff too to be more conscious about who we hire here at Lehigh as photographers and caterers and all of that, and just trying to find even in the Lehigh Valley, there were a few sort of organic people that put up web pages that mm-hmm. said, you know, support these businesses. And then trying to match them with who the Lehigh alums were. It was a lot of work, you know, so I was like, oh, I wish there were a service. (laughs) Yeah. And so that we're, yes, that's what we're trying to do. We're also trying to, what I didn't mention is we also do encourage um, any blader that's on the app to kind of have a profile, not just a profile, Mm -hmm. but a media kit. Um, We are also working with them to, as part of the university, have websites, have a portfolio, like all these things need to be in place. And if you don't have them, what do we need to do to get you one as soon as possible? Right, right. Fantastic. All right. Well, we are um, nearing the end of our time. Is there anything else that we didn't ask you about or anything you want to tell us about before we go? No, I'm just excited to uh, connect with the Lehigh University. I look forward Mm -hmm. to keeping in touch with everyone. Um, Let me know how I can be of service to any one of you, whether it's through asking me questions, mentorship, I don't know, a service that I can provide. Building relationships is a two-way street. So I'm here to support you all as well as I know that you all are here to support me. Absolutely, we are. All right, well, this was fascinating and um, it's so great to see that you're on your way and um you know in a few years we'll be hearing even more about you know yeah. your national brand and your <laughs> brand, you know. um so this is fantastic thank you very much nadia thank you and thank you for being a part of the journey from the beginning yeah. all right bye 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 have a great day everyone